So the company's name is Off-Road Only, and I'm gonna argue that's a little misleading. Here's why. I just installed the Sway Lock dual rate sway bar from Off-Road Only, ORO, and as it turns out, I get some on-road benefit as well. So this whole off-road only thing, yeah, not quite because in addition to the off-road benefit, which I'll explain here in a second, there is some demonstrated on-road improvement with handling and body roll or lack of body roll. As a matter of fact, I'll show you this graphic here, uh, but I'll go into more detail in a future video when I do a full sort of review of its on and off-road characteristics. But I did some testing and actually the sway lock seemed to perform better and limit body roll over the stock sway bar in the Jeep Wrangler and, uh, and much uh, superior over you know a completely disconnected state. So that's an interesting data point. Again, I'll go into more of that in a future video. For now though, this video, I'm gonna talk quickly about the sway lock you'll see a little bit of talking head stuff and then i'm going to go into the installation of the actual sway lock onto my 2015 jeep wrangler i'm going to install the main component right the dual rate sway bar and the links and then in a follow-up video i'll integrate it into my onboard air system because i have the uh the air actuated disconnect version of the sway lock this video is gonna be helpful if you have either one of those because getting to the point where you integrate the air is the same for both. But if you have the mechanical version, once you do the install that's in this video, you're done. Disconnect, reconnect, disconnect, reconnect manually. If you want in-cab controls via air, like what I'm doing, then you're gonna to wanna to watch the second video and I'll show you how to integrate all that in. So why the sway lock for me? And some of you may even know, right? You may be going, wait, didn't you just install a sway bar? That is right, I did. I installed a Rubicon sway bar. I have a non-Rubicon Wrangler. I just put on a Rubicon sway bar because I wanted that disconnect feature. And, uh, and I used a air disconnect system that I got from Team Tech Off-Road. It was a great add-on to, to be able to add an air disconnect actuator onto a factory system. But here's the problem, it's still a like factory sway bar. So um, you're either completely disconnected or you're connected. And so there is something to be said for having a little bit more off-road control from a sway bar that has still just a little bit of anti-sway characteristics. That's why the Curry Anti-Rock has been so popular because it improves your off-road handling particularly at speed, but even in rock crawling, by giving just a little bit of resistance to body roll and thus improving handling. The problem with things like that, a single rate, uh, a system like the Curry is, it's a compromise on on-road handling. So the reason I never went with the anti-rock, and this isn't an anti-anti-rock statement, uh, seems weird to say that, uh, but I know a lot of people who have it installed and almost all of them will agree it's not quite as good on the road. Great off-road benefits, but it's a compromise. On-road, handling isn't as good. It's a little bit softer and most people get used to it. Um, I didn't like that idea. I sort of like, uh, you know, my Jeep is 90% on the road and 10% off the road. So I don't wanna compromise my on-road stability in my daily driver. So that's why I never went with that system. Uh, so I was really intrigued with the off-road only sway lock, which has a dual rate system. It has an on-road setting, which is actually stiffer than the factory on-road uh, sway bar. Uh, and again, proof is in the pudding, uh, and I'll show that later. Um, but it does have the off-road characteristic, which gives a smaller uh, diameter uh, sway bar that has um, more flexibility. It does have that off-road benefit uh, without the compromise of losing the on-road. And that's why I went and installed this ORO sway lock is because I have increased road performance and increased off-road performance. At least that's what they say. I still have to get out and do some more testing. But anyway, so 
I'm about to wrap up the talking head piece. We can get into the install. So uh, here we go. Uh, this is me uh, going through the install of the ORO sway lock. Uh, I will give you some voiceover uh, tips along the way, maybe a little background music uh, to keep you entertained while you watch me do this install. And if you have any questions, feel free to hit me up in the comments and make sure you subscribe so that you don't miss the future videos on the uh, ORO sway lock. Let's get to it. All right. One important point I want to make before we get started is the sway lock uses the factory sway bar mounting locations. And that's important because if you're like me and you removed your crash bar for a bumper install, you can't run a system like, say, the Terraflex dual rate system that uses that crash bar as a mounting location. So uh, just something I wanted to point out. This works if you've removed your crash bar. All right, so once you drag all of those shiny parts out of the box, the first thing we want to do is remove the existing sway bar, if you have one installed, and the links. Now, you're going to remove the sway bar mounting bolts from the frame, but you need to keep those. That's actually the one thing that we're going to reuse. You will notice also that I have the steering stabilizer relocation bracket. This is also an ORO product I did a video on previously but that's why you see this sort of extra part that you might not have. So uh, go check out my video if you're interested in that. So now I'm looking for the gray aluminum mounts to hold the frame bushings, and uh, here they are already assembled. We are going to have to remove those little Zerk fittings and take out the bushings for this part of the install because we need that hole all the way through for the frame bolts. So you can see here the front of my Jeep is to the left of the screen. So uh, I'm installing the rear bolt first. The front bolt, I'm going to go ahead and put some thread lock on because we're going to tighten that down. But we are leaving the rear bolt loose on both sides just for that final uh, adjustment. It'll make it easier to get the torsion bar into the bushings. Now I am taking a measurement here, and here's why. The system is sort of designed around a 31 and 13 16 inch outer dimension of those gray frame mounts. So the closer you can get to that measurement, the easier the rest of the install is going to go. The spacers and all that that come with it are sort of designed around that. Once you have that pretty close, uh, you can go ahead and torque those down to 45 uh, to 55 foot-pounds should be good. And again, don't tighten down the rearward bolts because we need a little bit of rotation there uh, just to make sure we have a way to get those torsion bars in. And you can see here why we have to do this first before we put the bushings in because you can't get to it after the fact. All right, so the smaller diameter torsion bar has a hole on one side and, uh, and not the other. And that's important to note. The side with the hole is the one that's going to go where the latching arm is. The outer larger torsion bar is the same on either end. But when you install the smaller one inside the larger one, make sure the hole is on the side with your latching arm. In my case, it's gonna be on the driver's side. So I'm slipping it in from the driver's side now. That's what she said. <laughs> and uh, just running it across to the passenger side. No bushings in yet. I'm gonna add those in next. All right, once you get the torsion bar assembly in place, you're gonna to wanna to point the triangle part towards the rear of the Jeep. That's gonna go straight back. And uh, you can see here the bushing has a hole for the Zerk fitting to go through. It's actually gonna go uh, through the hole a little bit and keep it from rotating. And so you're gonna line that up with the hole in the gray frame bracket for the bushings. And the first one's pretty easy to get in. You just sort of slip it in and uh, it might be a little bit snug, which is sort of what you want, but if you have too many problems, you can put a little bit of grease on it, but I did it fine uh, without having to do that. I did put a little thread lock on this Zerk fitting, and then I'm gonna tighten that down and hold that driver side bushing in place. All right, now for the passenger side, a little bit snugger, and this is why we left those rearward bolts loose because you want a little bit of opportunity to sort of work this whole thing together. Now be nice and gentle. You don't want to tear up the inside of those bushings, but once you get it all the way completely inside, uh, you know, the edge, then you can use something like I'm using here, a little piece of uh, wood just to sort of um, coerce it 
into place. Keeping in mind, you need to make sure that that zerk hole is lined up. Now there is a little hole drilled on the outer lip of that bushing that aligns with the zerk hole. So you can use that for an alignment as you guide it into place. All right, then we're gonna torque down to that zerk fitting and move on to adding the spacers. Now I'm gonna space mine about a half an inch further to the driver's side than the passenger side. So from a spacer perspective with my test fit, I'm using one of the wider spaces and one of the skinnier spacers on this passenger side. And I'm just slipping on this dual hub arm to the passenger side just for a test fit. And then I'll go around and uh, make sure that I'm not hitting anything and I've got ample clearance. I'll do the same thing on the driver's side. I'll put on my rest of my spacers and then install the inner arm just to make sure that it's not hitting. And I have pretty good clearance with that setup. So now that I know that my spacers are right, then, uh, then I can continue to tighten everything down. If you run into some issues, you might try sliding things around with those spacers. All right, now I'm using the installation tool to tighten everything down and get those arms pressed onto the torsion bars. So there's that little stud that goes in the middle of the torsion bar. And then I'm gonna add the heavy washer and then use the nut to tighten it down. Now you wanna make sure that the torsion bar is aligned with the arm. And remember I had you point that point part, the V shape, uh, and that's to line up with these bars. So just as you're tightening things down, that has to be in place. And it doesn't take a lot of pressure to suck the arm onto the end of the torsion bar. And you can see here, I'm just lightly doing this. If it takes a lot of pressure, if you feel like you have to crank on it, you probably have your torsion bar misaligned with your arm. All right, it started out really light, so I know that everything was aligned properly, but now it's getting pretty hard to uh, to tighten down, and that's telling me that it's cinching up tight. You can visually look or use like a zip tie end or something like that to get in there and make sure that that torsion bar goes all the way to that center seam uh, in the arm. And then now I'm going to put these bolts through from the top and then add in these uh, aircraft locking nuts. Now, these are gonna go with the, um, the flat of the nut facing up against the arm. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, these are sort of a unique uh, lock nut style that I haven't seen before, so I thought I'd share with you, make sure you knew how they went. And these locking nuts are gonna get torqued to 45 foot-pounds. All right, what I'm doing here is just using a piece of cardboard to protect the arm and a hammer, just to tap it towards the driver's side so that it seats fully against that aluminum bushing mount. And that'll give me the entire torsion arm length on the driver's side, which is what I'm working on next. Now I'm adding in the rest of my spacers. I end up with two of the skinnier ones and two of the fatter ones. And uh, like I said, that worked out in my test fit. Now, same installation tool except you insert the stud and uh, then um, what we're going to do is add in this uh, little tube here, uh, standoff tube, and then back to the heavy washer and that little nut. And here we're going to press on the inner arm all the way onto the larger diameter torsion bar. And same as before, if everything is lined up, it should go pretty smoothly. And in this case, we're looking for the end of that torsion bar to go all the way to the end of that arm. And once it's uh, tightened down all the way, you'll know it. It'll all sort of start to grab. All right, now I'm gonna go ahead and put a bolt and uh, one of the lock nuts onto the inner torsion bar and lock that in place. And you can see how that inner uh, larger diameter bar goes all the way to the very outside edge of that inner arm. All right, next we're gonna install the latching arm. Because I'm using the air actuated version of this, I need to find a way to prop this open. I'm just gonna use one of the jam nuts from the links. If you've got the mechanical one, you can just open it up and uh, it will allow everything to sort of fit into place. Now this arm is gonna slip over the inside torsion bar. And again, you have to have it pointed in the right direction so that it's keyed properly. 
we're going to use the same installation tool, this time without that big standoff spacer, just the larger uh, flat washer and the nut and, of course, that stud. And we're going to tighten it down, and it should independently move from the inner torsion bar. Uh, and then we're going to add that bolt and nut, torque it down to 45 foot-pounds, and the inner outer arms and the uh, the dual arm on the other side are now installed. I no longer need that little spacer there and you can see now the two arms have locked together. Now on the latching arm side you're going to have a zerk fitting and uh, you're going to use the thinner flat washer, the fender washer, and then install that zerk. That zerk is why we needed the hole on the inner smaller diameter torsion bar. On the other side, we're just going to use this uh, bolt and the washer as sort of a cosmetic uh, cover for that uh, little hole there. So uh, a zerk only on one side, the side with the latching arm. And then here's a look at uh, with the spacers. I've got a little bit of room here. I mean, that's you want it to be snug but not overly tight. You can see this side's pretty tight, but that's because I have a little bit more room on the other side. As I start to use a vehicle, that'll sort of normalize. Uh, so you don't want it too, too tight, uh, but you don't also want it too loose because you don't want it to slide back and forth. Then I'm going to torque down the, uh, the other two bolts for the frame mounts and get that done. And then next, uh, we're going to move to the links. Uh, these links are pretty cool, pretty heavy duty. And actually comes with a variety of options. There's three separate links of these tubes that you will then put together with studs uh, to match whatever it is you need from a length perspective. So I went ahead and pre-installed these, uh, including with the little jam nuts, just to get a test fit for me. Now I'm uninstalling them, partly to show you, but partly to, um, to further prepare them. What I want to do is use an anti-seize product. Uh, on all of the uh, connection points just to keep them from, uh, you know, uh, corrosion locking uh, together. Uh, but when you uh, install these, you uh, can use whatever combination of links uh, you want. So there are, um, as you can see, three different. So I'm not using the larger ones for my particular uh, build. I'm using the middle size and the smaller size with the one stud in the middle. And what you're shooting for is um, enough of a link length that whenever you go to full droop, you don't, uh, you don't flip them inside out. And the instructions are pretty comprehensive on this. Uh, so, um, you know, the old rule of thumb of the, uh, the torsion bar arm should be parallel to the ground is pretty good and that's kind of what I shoot for, but more importantly is that the links don't flip inside out uh, at full droop. So I'm installing uh, these together with the uh, anti-seize product. One of the important things to know here is we want to lock those two bars together with the center stud that you just watched me install. The way to do that is to just really crank down on those jam nuts, uh, hitting it from both ends and at first, it's going to tighten the jam nut to the surface that's immediately adjacent to it. Then after that gets tight, it's going to transfer all of that torque to the center where the two sections of the links uh, are connected. And it's going to tighten that even further on the stud. All right, so go ahead and do my test fit. And then I work on aligning those joints so that they line up properly. One thing that's important to note here is while it's okay to start out with having the links on each side be the same length uh, in the end that matters less than getting them fit perfectly to your jeep so i'm going to start with them lined up but i'm going to adjust here uh, in a minute now also in your kit comes these little tabs to reinforce the mounting location for the links where they mount to the axle I don't need this because I have an aftermarket axle that already has beefed up mounting points. But if you're running a factory axle, they recommend using these and at least bolting them in first and then welding them later. The instructions cover this fairly well. All right, now I'm going to start installing the links. I'm going to go ahead and set up the driver side, but I'm going to completely install the passenger side first, the non-latching side. 
uh, just so that I can make sure that the links are the right size for my Jeep. Again, they're gonna be close to being identical in length, but I want to make sure that they're perfect for my setup. So I am using an anti-seize on these. Uh, bolts go through and then uh, the little standoff spacer and then the link. So now I'm already on to the passenger side and I'm gonna use the original tested length link, <laughs> it's hard to say, uh, on this side and then I'll do my final adjustments on the latching side so I can really make sure that everything lines up properly. So for these, the links, um, they're gonna get torqued down to 90 foot-pounds, and uh, that's a lot, but these are half-inch bolts, so uh, yeah. And of course, the beauty of this is you never have to take them apart again. All right, so that's what it looks like on the passenger side, all ready to go. You can see I have that arm pretty close to being level, uh, which is what I was shooting for. But now what I'm gonna do is go over and adjust so that on the latching side, whenever I put the link on the stud there on the arm, the latching mechanism engages easy. What you don't want is any forced torsion on that. Uh, as a matter of fact, on the driving uh, torsion bar, the on-road larger outer diameter one, uh, you can actually sort of tweak it to the point where it might actually introduce some pull into the Jeep. So what you want is get that uh, last link set up so that everything is latched easily. And uh, once I get it all tightened up and adjusted here, I'll show you, but you should be able to sort of freely move that latch mechanism in and out. Now, of course, I haven't hooked up my air yet, so um, you can just see here I can manually open it up and then it closes right up. So uh, if you have to force that or, or sort of rock the Jeep, uh, significantly to get it to, to go into place, then you probably don't have your links well aligned. Here is sort of the final test to make sure that whenever I give it full droop and uh, basically jacking up the driver's side, uh, you can see I've got plenty of room there where those links aren't gonna flip inside and out. And that's kinda, kinda the goal I'm going for here. So really that is the install of the sway lock system again if you have the manual sway lock the manual latching version you're probably going to be done right now uh, you probably need to put some stickers on and uh, don't forget to grease everything up which is easy because by the time you get done with this you'll be like oh yeah sweet i did it and then you forget yeah you've got uh, some zerks to grease so uh, there's three of them that one on the end and then the two underneath at the frame bushings uh, but after you get all that done, you're pretty much done if you're on the manual side. If you're going to connect it to your onboard air like I am, you're going to want to watch the next video, which will be uh, setting it up for uh, air-controlled uh, unlatching of that mechanism to go into the off-road mode. Anyway, guys, that's it. Uh, stay tuned. Thanks for watching, and I will catch you on the next one.